Here's a question for you. When you think of Michael Bay, what comes to mind? Really big explosions? A camera that won't stop moving? How about characters that scream all the time? Optimus! Personally, I think of the year 1996, the year that the Spice Girls made their grand debut, and the year that hoof and mouth disease killed over six million cattle across the world. <laughs> It's also the year of Michael Bay's best movie, a bright, shining diamond buried deep in a giant mound of crap that is his career called The Rock, which gave us the team-up of Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery and caused Roger Ebert to say this. I really liked it a whole oh. lot. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Do you like random, sporadic outbursts? Maybe! Well, then I've got a movie made just for you. Grab your favorite Beatles album, kids, as we take a spoiler-heavy look at The Rock. Bye! So, The Rock starts like any great movie, with a naked Nicolas Cage playing a guitar. You see, this is FBI chemical weapons expert Stanley Goodspeed, and he's had a very bad day. Why? Well, because a package that was addressed to my apartment ended up at his office by mistake. Stone Age cave girls in the raw. Kinky. Unfortunately, that package also contained a very large bomb that Stanley had to defuse. So, as you can imagine, he's pretty stressed out. However, things quickly go from bad to worse when his girlfriend, Carla, says this. I'm pregnant. No! This guy can't catch a break. Good lord. I'm trapped! The next day, we cut to San Francisco, a city famous for its trolleys, sourdough bread, homeless camps, and streets covered in human poop. It's also famous for Alcatraz Island, and it's here that we see a group of school kids who are on a field trip, which, I'll be honest, seems like an odd choice for a field trip. But when I was in fourth grade, my class went to a slaughterhouse, so who am I to judge? <laughs> Anyway, suddenly and without warning, the island is taken over by General Frank Hummel and his band of rogue marines who take everyone hostage and who come heavily equipped with helicopters, guns, and even a sassy black lady. If I'd have known this was going to happen, I'd have my motherfucking gun. So you may be asking, why are they doing this? Well, I'm glad you asked, because the next seven minutes of the movie goes to exhaustive lengths to explain everything to the audience. But just to sum it all up, it turns out that the general was in charge of illegal black ops operations all over the world, and he's demanding that the United States government pay a ransom so that the families of the men who died under his command can be compensated. If the government refuses to pay, then he will launch a deadly chemical weapon called VX Gas into the city of San Francisco, which is powerful enough to wipe out the whole city. And just to make sure that you still don't believe that the general is a man who should not be messed with, the movie has a character read off his entire resume just to really drive the point home. Three tours in Vietnam, Panama, Grenada, Desert Storm, three Purple Hearts. Okay, I get, I get it. Well, enough of all that garbage. Let's have some sex. <laughs> As Stanley and Carla take advantage of not needing a condom, Stanley gets a call from his office telling him that he has to go to San Francisco because the FBI has come up with a plan. What is it? They want to take back the island by force, but the blueprints of the island are out of date, and the only way that the mission will succeed is to have someone with first-hand knowledge of Alcatraz show them the way. Then there's a random argument about Santa Claus does not exist. It does exist. Anyway, it soon becomes clear that the only man who can help them is John Mason, a former British spy who is the only man to have escaped Alcatraz and who's played by Sean Connery. Just the way your mother likes it. After offering Mason his freedom and a chance to stay at a nice hotel for a change, Mason agrees to help. And then he gives a review of The Last Jedi for some reason. Piece of shit. A bit later at the hotel, Mason gets cleaned up. He takes a hot shower, puts on a nice suit, and even even gets a haircut from an offensive gay stereotype. Barbara? No. Stylist. Then Mason decides to do what any rational human would do. He throws the FBI director off of the balcony and makes a run for his freedom by stealing a Hummer. And it's here that we get the obligatory high-speed chase, full of all of the things that make Michael Bay movies, well, Michael Bay movies. There's explosions, cars flipping over, there's even a guy playing a saxophone. What more could you possibly want? 
After the chase is over, we find out that Mason has a daughter, and after calling her from the stolen Hummer's mobile phone, she meets with him at a park. But sadly, this family reunion is cut short when the FBI shows back up and takes Mason to their command center. At the command center, everyone is preparing for the impending assault on the island. Stanley is having some reservations about being in a combat situation. Fine combat, sir. And this guy says the most random line of dialogue that's ever been captured on camera. An incursion underwater to retake an impregnable fortress held by an elite team of U.S. Marines in possession of 81 hostages and 15 guided rockets armed with VX poison gas. Okay, we get it. Calm down. So, the Navy SEALs load up. And after enjoying a refreshing swim through the San Francisco Bay, they end up in the furnace room of the prison. But there's one small problem. The door is locked from the other side. And the only way in is through the furnace, which looks like a hidden level in Super Mario Brothers. But luckily for them, Mason has memorized the timing. And after remembering how to stop, drop, and roll, he's able to open the door and let them inside. Welcome to the rock. Now, I just want to pause right here and mention something really quickly. Remember when Mason said, I memorized the timing. Well, when he opens the door and lets the Navy SEALs in, the door opens from inside the room he just went into. Why would he need to memorize the furnace thing when he would have just been able to open that door from that room when he was escaping? That doesn't make sense. Oh well, who cares? Welcome to the rock. After that, things pretty much go according to plan. The SEALs are able to avoid homo soldiers, and eventually they make their way to the prison shower, where they intend to climb into the prison itself. But there's one small problem. <laughs> While disarming one of the laser sensors, the SEALs accidentally trigger a secondary motion sensor, and Hummel's men quickly surround them. Hoping to avoid unnecessary killing, General Hummel asks them to surrender. After all, the General has the high ground, and we all know what happens when you try to fight against the high ground. Yeah, at this point, tensions are pretty high. Boy, I sure hope some loose bricks don't fall down and cause everyone to start shooting. This is just a big misunderstanding. With all of the SEALs dead, it's up to just Stanley and Mason to disable all of the rockets before Hummel can launch them into the city. After some careful sneaking around, Stanley and Mason find the first rocket that's being guarded by one of the Marines. Luckily, however, Mason is able to kill him by slowly throwing a knife and just hoping that he doesn't move out of the way. It's just a flesh wound, honestly. A moment later, a second Marine comes out of nowhere, and a firefight breaks out. And after being shot, the Marine tries to throw a grenade at Stanley and Mason, causing Mason to act quickly and crush him with an air conditioner. <laughs> with those Marines out of the way, Stanley gets to work, removing the guidance chips from the rockets. That way, if Hummel does launch the rockets, they will splash down into the ocean and neutralize the gas. But it doesn't take long for the rest of the Marines to catch on to what's happening causing Stanley and Mason to take cover in a mine. Wait, why is there a mine under Alcatraz? What could possibly be the purpose of this? Is this a Temple of Doom situation? Are there kid slaves down there? Cover your heart! Kalima! Kalima! As more Marines follow them down into the mine, Mason is able to kill one of them by setting him on fire. Stanley, however, is not so lucky and ends up in a slow-speed minecart chase. Annoyed that he's losing so many men, General Hummel gets desperate and decides to draw Mason and Stanley out of hiding by threatening a hostage. So, Mason decides to confront Hummel himself, allowing Stanley time to find the other rockets and disable them. And it's here that we get what I think is the best part of the movie, where two great actors, Sean Connery and Ed Harris, get to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one another. Unfortunately, this scene is cut short, as Stanley is caught by two Marines who really wanted to act out the kissing scene from the first Spider-Man movie. Hi, sweetie. After being captured, Stanley and Mason are put in prison cells. But like the rest of us, there's only so much of Nick Cage that Mason can stand. Butthole! So he quickly escapes. How? By making a rope out of old mattresses. Now you may be asking yourself, why are there mattresses in a prison that closed decades ago? Well, I'm not sure. But I think the bigger question is, why is it this easy to escape from prison? Barely an inconvenience. General Hummel now finds himself in a sticky situation. The deadline for the government to pay is just minutes away. And once it becomes clear that the government will not pay them, he gives the okay to launch one of the rockets into the city. But at the last moment, the general causes the rocket to change course and splash down into the ocean. 
Angry at the general's change of heart, the remaining soldiers confront him about what's happened. It doesn't take long for this confrontation to become a mutiny, which quickly turns into a Mexican standoff. Eventually, bullets do start to fly, and General Hummel is mortally wounded. But before he dies, he tells Stanley where the last rocket is. And as Mason holds the rest of the Marines off with a machine gun, Stanley takes off to the lighthouse. As Stanley begins to work on the final rocket, he's stopped by the candy man who explains why he hates Charmin toilet paper. I don't like soft ass shit. And then he threatens Stanley with a large knife. But Stanley has the greatest weapon of all, a pun. You're the rocket man. With all of the soldiers gone and the rockets disabled, Stanley quickly makes his way to the signal point so that he can call off the attack from the Air Force. And luckily, the pilots do see him before they fire all of their thermite missiles, and the day is saved. And that's it, the movie's over. And when it's all said and done, the movie that we get is Michael Bay's best, with a solid cast that knows how to act without being too over the top, a script that isn't too bloated, and just enough of Michael Bay's directing style to make the movie interesting without getting in the way. And that really is the biggest detriment to any of Michael Bay's movies, Michael Bay himself. So much so that his style has essentially turned into a parody of what not to do when making an action movie. Just for a moment, let's compare a scene from this movie to a scene from some of his later work. Take this moment for example. Stanley and Carla are having an intimate moment on top of a roof, which is established by a quick trucking shot to the right and quickly cuts to medium over the shoulder shots to capture their conversation. It's a nice, uncomplicated way to capture capture all that you need in the moment. Now contrast to this with this moment from Transformers 2. Sam, played by Shia LaBeouf, and Michaela, played by Megan Fox, are also having a nice moment together. But Michael Bay can't stop moving the camera. It's just movement for the sake of movement. And what's worse is the audience is probably too busy fighting off the motion sickness that this scene has induced to pay attention to what's being said by the characters. I'm throwing up. You're making me throw up. Somehow this man's ability to direct a cohesive sequence has gotten worse over his 30 years of experience, and it's really quite astonishing. Of course with The Rock, there are still plenty of moments where the movie goes full Michael Bay, but it's not overbearing. And really, all of this just goes to show that a director's restraint can go a long way. Speaking of restraint, Nicolas Cage is also fairly reserved, at least for a Nicolas Cage performance anyway. What do you say we cut the chit chat? A-hole. Yes, there are a few times where he goes a little bit wild, but he never goes over the line. And that's why I think this is probably his best action performance of the 90s. Zeus's butthole! And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about Sean Connery. At this point in his career, he was already a legend, an Oscar winner, and this movie really proves why. He has tremendous screen presence, and even at the age of 66, he was still at the top of his game. Suck it for Beck. <laughs> Sadly, however, this would be Connery's last movie that's worth seeing. The very next movie he did was The Avengers, followed by a bunch of duds, like Playing by Heart, Entrapment, Finding Forrester, and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. But those last few years certainly don't define his career, and he will always be remembered for the icon that he truly is. So, at the end of the day, would I recommend this movie? Absolutely. After all of these years, The Rock is still, well, rock solid. If you have seen it before, then there's still a lot left to enjoy. And if you haven't seen it, I think you'll like it a lot. You can see it on Disney+, Plus, or you can purchase it to rent on Amazon or YouTube. Give it a watch. I don't think you'll be disappointed.